Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Norris. Uh, I very much appreciate that I, <laughs> you have come along. And I would like to thank you all to come here today. I know it's really brave to start your week in Brussels Monday morning. But well, at, <laughs> at least we have some good weather. Eh? So <laughs> Brussels is not so bad after all. So let me explain uh, what uh, we are going to do today. Um, I, we have invited people uh, who have the experience of a new era, which we are trying to explore. So, before the European Commission taking any formal initiative, we would like to hear from you, representatives of the science, the industry, the stakeholders, our uh, regional advisor councils, and of course our <coughs> member states. And uh, since uh, this is uh, a new initiative, a new era to explore, uh, we need to hear all, all you can bring to us. We are uh, persuaded in one way or another that maritime special planning or marine special planning or maritime and coastal, this is the best, uh, special planning is very useful. But we have to persuade um, our governments, the parliament, uh, that's why we have here representatives of uh, our member states, the member states that I can say are more advanced in this exercise. Mrs. Christas, who is the Minister of the Portuguese Government for the Environment, Agriculture and Fisheries, and uh, well, Portuguese Government is uh, the champion, I can say. Um, and uh, we are here to hear from you, your experience, and uh, I hope you can also give us some good practices about this issue. And also, uh, Anna here, Mrs. Namjoko from uh, the Polish government, they also have done a lot. We have here also Mrs. Meissner, who was the rapporteur in the parliament, European parliament, about this issue, and we have all you, all you. So let me say a few words in order to uh, give more food for thought. So our idea is that today the oceans and seas around the European Union are shrinking. Don't get me wrong, me wrong, I don't mean that they are becoming smaller, but what I mean is that more and more users are racing to develop their activities there and to compete with those who are already there. Just to give you some numbers to understand what I mean, maritime transport grows at an average rate of over 8.5% every year, almost 10% every year. And cruise tourism alone has tripled its size between uh, 99 and uh, 2009 in a decade. Just a decade and they have tripled their running. Even more potential rests in those sectors that are only beginning to take off, renewable wind energy or aquaculture. Offshore wind energy is expected to grow from 4 gigawatts capacity this year to 150 gigawatts in 2030. This is 4,000%. And we have to understand the potential of deep sea mining and non-wind renewable energy. At the same time, these uses are competing with more traditional activities such as dredging, which are also growing. Dredging companies have increased their turnover by 150% in less than a decade. And then is aquaculture. I am convinced that we need to think in terms of more, not less aquaculture. We need more and more aquaculture. This industry can and indeed must grow in Europe if we are to meet the rising demand for fisheries products and make the catching sector more sustainable. One thing that all these activities have in common is where they take place they all need, they all use maritime space. So, this is a possibility, this can be also a problem. Later today, we will be hearing from shipping operators, for example, who will tell us 
that wind farms placed in less than optimal places cost time and money and are even a, a safety hazard sometimes. So it's not so easy. Fisheries operators, on the other hand, calculated years ago that a badly coordinated use of maritime space, crowding them out, can cost them hundreds of millions in revenue. This means more space than now better plant. This is what we need. We need more space, but we need also better plant space. <coughs> the same is true in many areas of the world. You have heard what Mr. Norse said before, Norway, but also Australia, United States, they have set up systems to manage their ocean space coherently. They too have understood that oceans are economic engines and have made special planning a key component of their ocean policy. This is what we need to do in the European Union. And this is what my initiative is about. So our idea is to do it also in the European Union. Let's have maritime special planning for a sustainable exploitation of our maritime spaces and marine resources. If we do not give ourselves the means to manage the growing demand for sea space across our sea basins, these developments could be slowed or even blocked. Their impact on the environment would be higher and they would cost more to set up. Studies have been carried out to estimate the economic benefit of maritime special planning in EU sea basins. So it's not only about the environment. It's about economic profit. And this will be our argument to persuade the governments and the sector about it. I will spare you the details, but the economic benefits, either in investments or in simple economic returns, go into hundreds of millions of euro. And we have studies proving that. Operators tell us already that they need, in order to cooperate with us, they need transparency, efficiency, predictability, and stability. Transparency about the rules and priorities that determine how offshore activities can take place. Efficiency of the processes that allow them to invest, not make their life more difficult. Predictability about what is possible now and what will be possible after 10 years, for example. Stability, so they know that the activity they are undertaking now has a future. They know that maritime special planning can provide them with these essential conditions for their success. An additional element to consider is that all this is coherent with what happens in land, coastal management. That is why I'm working closely with my colleague, Commissioner Potocnik, to ensure com coherence with their policy on integrated coastal zone management. We need this. We need a coherent approach for maritime special planning and coastal management. So my intention is uh, to work uh, closely with relevant actors to develop this policy. Rest assured, however, our intention, the Commission's intention, is not at all to interfere with concrete planning issues at national level. That's why we have the ministers here today. That's why the subsidiarity principle of the treaty is relevant for this exercise, and we are going to respect what the member states would like to do. This is why we have organized this event, and I would like to thank you all for being here. With your help, I hope that we will be able to announce a proposal on the best way to further develop maritime special planning in the course of this year. This is our intention. The main aim of this initiative will be to ensure that planning is ensured at member state level, respecting what they are doing, but we also need a common framework on how this is done. We don't uh, want the national initiatives to compete each other because afterwards this will mean a great problem for us. So we need a common framework to how this is done. 
And also, we would like to be sure that there is a fully functioning cross-border cooperation between states on planning issues. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Europe is now at a crossroads. Everybody knows that. Everybody speaks about the crisis. We need concrete <coughs> action now to make sure that the European Union delivers on growth and jobs. This is the number one priority for the European Commission. We need to set the seat now for those economic activities that will carry us into the future. So, blue growth is what I'm doing under my portfolio about this exercise. Blue growth is about investing in maritime Europe, but focusing our efforts where it matters and working with emerging sectors to secure their development. There is no need to intervene where growth is already there. But what we need really is to give a momentum to the emerging sectors. So we are currently determining the best course for this and uh, I plan to propose a policy initiative on how to harness blue growth later this year. Our focus will be on emerging sectors, for example, aquaculture, seabed mining, offshore renewable energy sectors and maritime tourism. So these are our priorities in order to give uh, momentum to new, to emerging sectors that are not in momentum what, uh, which is not already there. Blue growth can also focus on how we can secure the health of our coastal economies that depend on their maritime assets. We are trying to organize the operation of regional funds and policy in a way that supports the development of coastal communities to the greatest extent, extent possible. In some dear participants, we have to do what it takes to make sure that the right conditions exist for a blue economy to develop. And maritime special planning is the right answer to secure and support blue growth for the European Union. I look forward to hearing from our panelists, all of them, and experts about their experience and their expectations. I welcome you all to the conference and I hope that we'll have some interest discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Damanaki. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Asuncion Christas, Minister of Agriculture, Sea, Environment and Spatial Planning of Portugal. Good morning, all of you. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Mrs. Damanaki, uh, Commissioner, for this important area of our future and of our economy. Uh, all, uh, Professor, thank you very much for coming from the other side of the Atlantic, and Minister and uh, dear. Uh, representant of the uh, European Parliament and all of you thank you for being here today it's a pleasure for me and an honor to be with you uh, I will just speak in Portuguese but anyway I would just like to uh, say a few words previously Gostaria de, antes de mais, um, felicitar a Comissão Europeia, and felicitar all, a Senhora Comissária like por esta iniciativa, que creio que já está a ser uma importante uh, iniciativa uh, para partilharmos as nossas uh, experiências e refletirmos sobre o futuro e os benefícios que o ordenamento do espaço marinho nos pode trazer no âmbito da política marítima integrada da União Europeia. O ordenamento uh, do espaço marítimo é é um dos instrumentos transsetoriais de apoio à política, à política marítima integrada. E eu penso que é, de facto, uh, crucial, e a sua implementação é crucial do ponto de vista da segurança jurídica, da previsibilidade e da transparência, como, aliás, a Sra. Comissária tão uh, bem referiu. É um mecanismo... Uh, 
fundamental para promover o empreendedorismo, o crescimento económico, a criação de novos empregos e oportunidades, mas também a coesão social e territorial e a qualidade do ambiente marinho. Mais do que isso, é também um mecanismo fundamental para assegurar que todos estes objetivos podem e devem ser atingidos de uma forma sustentável e duradoura no quadro de uma verdadeira economia azul, que é uma economia verde aplicada ao mar. E é bom que nos comecemos a habituar a chamar de economia azul e com isso convocar um conjunto de princípios e de preocupações que passam por aquele ponto, uh, referi logo no início, de não é mais, é e temos de conseguir fazer as coisas em conjunto, adicionalmente. A via do desenvolvimento sustentável implica, uh, para além de se olhar para o crescimento económico, implica atender à equidade social, ao bem-estar das populações, à redução dos riscos ambientais e de escassez de recursos. E aqui sabemos que as novas tecnologias e a inovação têm um papel fundamental a desempenhar na redução dos impactos sobre o meio e meio ambiente e recursos. O desenvolvimento de atividades sustentáveis e de meios de subsistência que garantam um oceano saudável e, simultaneamente, incentiva a criação de empregos sustentáveis vai exigir com toda a certeza, soluções tecnológicas e o aparecimento de projetos inovadores. E penso que aqui a cooperação entre os Estados, que se falava, o trabalho em rede que pode e deve ser estabelecido, é muitíssimo importante. É também necessário prever e criar mecanismos e acordos que permitam disponibilizar incentivos financeiros para a proteção dos ecossistemas marinhos. Ecossistemas temas que têm valor económico, embora tradicionalmente não sejam considerados nessa perspectiva. Se conseguirmos dar-lhes a importância de associar mecanismos financeiros, significa que estaremos a dar os sinais e o contexto para que o valor económico de um uso sustentável do mar seja interiorizado nos processos de planeamento e devidamente refletido nas decisões de investimento. O Sr. Comissário referia ainda agora que nós temos também um contraponto na terra e referia-se à orla costeira. Na nossa experiência de ordenamento do espaço terrestre, podemos, com toda a certeza, identificar boas soluções e más soluções. E muitas vezes as más soluções decorrem de incentivos errados do ponto de vista financeiro e do ponto de vista da forma como estes espaços contribuem para a inversão das receitas das so, zonas geográficas onde estão inseridos. Portanto, aqui um, não podemos explorar este ponto. Importa também realçar o papel que o conhecimento dos recursos tem nos processos de planeamento no especial dos usos e atividades marítimas. E eu penso que aqui nós continuamos a ter algum déficit de conhecimento. As falhas de conhecimento podem não só ditar a evolução do processo de planeamento e gestão espacial, mas, ao que é pior, podem facilmente tornar este processo contraproducente e prejudicial. A complexidade e o ainda relativo desconhecimento dos recursos do espaço marítimo, em especial quando se fala do mar profundo e as relações de interdependências que se verificam no meio marítimo, justificam que seja feito um claro investimento na investigação investigação e nas ciências marinhas, o qual permita melhorar o conhecimento e a compreensão dos fenómenos naturais e do funcionamento dos sistemas. Este conhecimento, alicerçado e apoiado por uma política clara de partilha de informação e de dados sobre o meio marinho, é fundamental para se alcançar um desenvolvimento sustentável e alimentar a cooperação transfronteiriça, transregional e internacional. Sabemos bem que sem sólidas bases de conhecimento 
estaremos a opinar e com dificuldades estaremos a construir soluções sustentáveis e por isso esse ponto, este ponto é para nós muito importante e é importante para a credibilidade que a Europa pode conseguir ter e mostrar e partilhar com o resto do mundo. Estes aspectos são igualmente indissociáveis das matérias ambientais que se discutem no âmbito da implementação da Diretiva Quadro de Estratégia Marinha, que se afirma como o pilar ambiental da política marítima integrada e deve ser devidamente considerada no ordenamento do espaço marítimo. O ordenamento e a exploração dos espaços marítimos é um desafio que se coloca a todos os países costeiros. E eu diria que tem especial acuidade para Portugal, pelo facto de possuir uma das maiores áreas marítimas da União Europeia. Portugal é, e foi desde sempre, um país marítimo. Mas mais do que isso, a sua dimensão e localização da área marítima sob sua jurisdição não deixa margem de dúvidas sobre a responsabilidade que ao país também compete em termos da maritimidade europeia no Atlântico, e estou a pensar no arquipélago dos Açores e da Madeira e necessariamente na visão e ordenamento deste espaço. As características únicas do espaço marítimo, a sua natureza tridimensional, envolvendo o leito e o subsolo marinho, a coluna de água e a atmosfera têm de estar refletidas no processo de ordenamento e em particular na espacialização que dele resulta. Neste espaço tridimensional coexistem atividades com regimes e perfis de localidade, mobilidade e temporalidade muito diversas, que vão desde atividades que apenas de um ponto de vista macroscópico apresentam alguma estacionaridade, de que são exemplo o transporte marítimo e as pescas, até atividades que possuem usos e infraestruturas individualmente fixas e relativamente perenes, como é o caso da exploração das energias offshore. No entanto, todas elas requerem níveis de monitorização, vigilância e controle que possam fornecer a base informacional necessária para uma gestão que tem de ser sempre flexível e adaptiva, capaz de refletir a natureza e a dinâmica dos ecossistemas marinhos. E aqui, quando cada vez mais se dizia há atividades Uh, com interesse sobre o mesmo espaço, uh, nós sentimos no dia a dia que cada atividade nova que aparece, seja de aquacultura, so, uh, seja de uh, instalação de projetos uh, um, de energia eólica offshore, farms, seja uh, investigação uh, ao nível da produção de algas para biocombustíveis, sentimos sempre fuels, um, aquilo example. que é uma resistência These natural por parte de quem durante séculos utilizou o mar como sendo apenas seu, que são os pescadores. Um, e este ponto é um ponto importante que discutíamos há pouco e concluímos os pescadores que têm uma licença sobre um espaço, não têm um espaço concreto específico a descrita à sua atividade, mas a verdade é que entre eles o espaço está retalhado, está dividido e cada pescador sente que tem um direito a um espaço concreto. Ordenar o espaço marítimo também é explicar que há várias atividades e todas elas podem e devem ter lugar também em benefício dos próprios pescadores. Mas este é um ponto de uma dimensão social que não é irrelevante. A flexibilidade e coerência do ordenamento do espaço marítimo exigem que seja conseguida uma dinâmica de escalas, a qual permita conseguir a articulação e complementaridade com a gestão integrada da zona costeira, também já aqui falada, e incorporar a especificidade do mar profundo e os desafios tecnológicos de investigação e de conhecimento que ele encerra. O plano de ordenamento do espaço marítimo português Está neste momento em fase de conclusão, já tem uma primeira versão que está a ser avaliada e analisada 
Este plano já foi objeto de avaliação ambiental, a qual permitiu enquadrar as opções estratégicas fundamentais e estabelecer as suas opções finais. Atendeu aos princípios da precaução, da gestão adaptativa e da abordagem ecossistémica e considerou as orientações do Roteiro para o Ordenamento do Espaço Marítimo, definição de princípios comuns na União Europeia, no qual são elencados os princípios comuns fundamentais para o Ordenamento do Espaço Marítimo na União. Os próximos passos atenderão naturalmente à evolução do ordenamento e uso do espaço marítimo nas molduras nacional, europeia e internacional. Como última nota, deve ser realçada a importância de que seja conseguida uma coerência do ordenamento espacial aos níveis regional e global, para o qual deverá assumir especial ênfase o desenvolvimento de projetos de cooperação entre Estados-membros através de iniciativas transfronteiriças ou internacionais, promovidas pelas regiões em estreita atividade e subordinadas aos desígnios nacionais, procurando que os processos sejam claros e transparentes, reduzindo o custo associado à exploração do mar e minimizando os conflitos da espacialização territorial. Este caminho penso que deve ser acadeado e encarado como um modelo de partilha do conhecimento e do saber, promovendo o desenvolvimento sustentável e construindo uma base de referência comum. E gostaria de uh, dar nota que Uh, ainda a semana passada tivemos uh, em Luanda, Angola, a reunião de uh, ministros do ambiente uh, dos países da comunidade de países de língua portuguesa, a Cplt. E esta reunião foi feita para preparar a, a posição desta comunidade de países de língua portuguesa para a conferência do Rio Mais Juntos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Uh, esta comunidade tem oito países, todos eles marinhos, como não é difícil de a maior parte centro no Atlântico, Brasil de um lado, Angola, Guiné, São Tomé e Príncipe, Cabo Verde do outro, Moçambique no Índico e Timor-Leste na Ásia. E conseguimos nesta declaração de Luanda, declaração conjunta, tocar muitos pontos e incluir dois ou três parágrafos sobre gestão dos gestão sustentável dos oceanos e incluir a noção de economia azul e crescimento azul, crescimento sustentável. Penso que também por aqui Portugal está muito empenhado em promover esta dimensão, conseguimos trazer mais países de outras geografias para uma preocupação que só será totalmente eficaz se conseguir ser uma preocupação também global. Penso que um, devemos marcar fortemente a dimensão da sustentabilidade e do uso e exploração dos oceanos na Conferência das Nações Unidas sobre o Rio Mais 20. Creio que é uma boa oportunidade para trazermos este tema para cima da mesa. Assim, conseguiremos que o mar nos traga os benefícios que todos desejamos de uma forma sustentável e duradoura. Muito obrigada. Thank you so much, Ms. Christas. I think we are at a, a very important point in the development of this concept in Europe. My country, the United States, embarked on an effort to develop a national ocean policy whose most important tool was what President Obama came to call coastal and marine spatial planning. But the economic crisis affects different places differently politically. And in the United States, progress on marine spatial planning, initially so promising and bold, has all but stopped. The government has made the calculation that 
if we want to move forward economically, we can't be doing this now. I think that is exactly wrong. And I think the European Union has an opportunity seeing what others have done correctly and incorrectly to do it right. And I'm thrilled to hear what I have been hearing from our first two speakers. One important thing that I should have said, but in my haste and nine hours of jet lag I forgot to say, is that we tend to think of oceans as being vast and operating on large spatial scales, and yet the way we make decisions is much more local or national. That can be a problem because the mismatch between the spatial scale of natural processes and government decision making is a source of ecological and economical problems everywhere in the world. Harmonizing the scales at which things happen is really important. And since ocean currents and uh, migrations of marine organisms are not going to change for our benefit, we have to change what we do to harmonize with them. And that will benefit us economically. And I should have mentioned that before, and please forgive me. Um, but I do have the pleasure, and I, I only met her today, of meeting Ms. Anna Vipik Namyotko, Under Secretary of State, the Ministry of Transport, Construction, and Maritime Economy. Sure. Sorry. The same microphone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. I would like to thank Ms. Maria Domanaki, uh, the Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, uh, and her team uh, for the concept and organization of today's conference and for inviting me what gives the opportunity to uh, directly participate in so important uh, EU Maritime event. I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you, the experts dealing with the maritime special planning. Uh, this, one of the cross-cutting tools on integrated maritime policy is essential for economic growth of coastal communities as well as for the economy of a country. Without proper allocation of space, no sustainable regional development can be achieved. This is even more important for governments today in the, this difficult time of economic slowdown. Speaking uh, of the integrated maritime policy, as my highlighted that an integrated approach to maritime issues is the only one solution for the EU and its member states to achieve the best possible use of CRS. The mission of the maritime policy should be the benefits for the people and economy resulting from a sustainable use of the coastal location and resources of the seas and oceans. So it is even that cooperation is important and worthwhile. There are two aspects particularly important for maritime special planning. Uh, one uh, is the diversity of sea basins uh, around Europe and in other uh, places in the world, uh, other areas. Obviously, all regions face different problems and challenges. Second one is the Commission's initiative uh, on uh, marine knowledge aiming at providing unified quality checked uh, data for the benefit of decision making for users. Of course, another uh, matter, what was already mentioned in a uh, uh, by, by uh, the Commissioner, the Integrated Coastal Zone Management. It is uh, so uh, important and uh, another um, process of, uh, uh, in our uh, European uh, community. 
Uh, all EU member states have already got an experience in special planning on land. But our experience uh, in sea space planning is a little. Since the last few years, the recognition of the importance of maritime special planning is growing continuously. The exchange of uh, maritime special planning mm, related information, experience and knowledge is crucial here. Well prepared maritime special plans have the potential to provide long term um, stability and predictability as well as to avoid competition for space in intensively used areas. It can also provide the much needed support for achieving the objectives of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Of course, uh, special planning is in national competence. Like sometimes on land, maritime special issues have a strongly transboundary character, often requiring a holistic approach for the whole regional sea or seas. Being a part of the Baltic Sea region, Poland actively participates in the work of regional organizations such as HALCOM and uh, an intergovernmental network vision and strategies around the Baltic Sea, VASAP. The joint HALCOM VASAP working group on maritime special planning was established in uh, 2010. This group functions as a possible example of proactive and innovative regional cooperation. The working group has developed a set of Baltic maritime special planning principles, next adopted by HALCOM, by VASAP, by countries in their own national um, regulations. The main principle of the Baltic uh, uh, maritime special planning provides the possibility of widening the horizon beyond purely sectoral special approach with uh, the ecosystem approach. Simultaneously, it also enables the countries to take into account the environmental threats which arise in the individual subregions. I would like to draw your attention uh, to the fact that the Baltic Sea regional uh, initiatives have already tested transboundary maritime planning in concrete case studies. The example is the Bolt Sea Plan, the uh, EU initiative financed from the resources of uh, Baltic Sea region program 2007-2013, uh, and the European Regional Development Fund. It is noted that January this year, the final conference uh, of uh, this project um, had been organized, uh, which aimed to show the trigger discussion on the latest uh, maritime special planning development as uh, policy as well as implement, implementation, implementation uh, level. Uh, I'm convinced that the experience from Balt Sea Plan uh, can and should be used uh, to boost maritime special plan development in uh, other European regions. Another example of EU founded project dedicated to the Baltic Sea region was Plan Botnia, an uh, interesting in, uh, initiative focusing on the Botnian Sea uh, era as a transboundary case between two coastal neighbors, uh, Sweden and Finland. And now let me say something about a Polish experience. In, Pols, in Poland, the coastal location is being considered as a particular important asset um, and national treasure. Uh, and of course, strategic importance for the long-term socio-economic development of the country. Therefore, we have to learn how to use the sea and its national, uh, natural resources fully and in balanced way. I uh, believe that uh, the next uh, panels uh, will try to give the uh, answer to uh, this and uh, some kind of uh, focus and uh, highlight it, the matter. For this reason, uh, Poland has been involved from uh, the very beginning, even in 2002, within the project Bal Coast and next Plan Coast and Balci Plan in developing and promoting the concept of maritime special planning and has been actively contributing to this 
course on the regional Baltic Sea forums. Uh, as uh, we mentioned before, Helcom and WhatsApp, uh, and of course in uh, the um, uh, uh, forum and works of DG Mare and DG Environment. Furthermore, we are participating in a research and development program to protect the Baltic Sea bonus, which is crucial for developing marine research and knowledge, also for the maritime special planning. Uh, lately, um, 13 of December um, last year, the National Special Development Concept uh, 2030 uh, has been adopted uh, by uh, Council of uh, Ministers in Poland. Uh, it is the most important national strategic document on the uh, special management on land and sea. Uh, this document contains the maritime area which was uh, absent from uh, the national level strategic documents until now. Uh, into the uh, mainstream of discussion on national special uh, development. The document presents a general vision of the um, country's special development, specifies objectives and uh, directions of the national uh, special development policy and indicates the my rules and mechanism for coordination and implementation of public uh, development policies with a significant uh, uh, territorial um, impact. Uh, the ecosystem approach of uh, NSDC 2030 covers uh, the maritime areas, both uh, the valuable habitats and uh, the corridors connecting them as well as uh, the submarine uh, landscapes and uh, submarine uh, cultural uh, heritage. Uh, the program uh, requires also the special plans should be developed for all Polish sea areas. We have started our works and uh, as I mentioned, we started uh, the first steps in 2002, so the process is uh, r difficult and required uh, uh, really uh, uh, great uh, and uh, effective uh, cooperation. Uh, we have uh, started our works um, um, and our actions are aimed especially at strengthening horizontal and vertical harmonization uh, process, at improving the public participation processes and also enabling the appropriate use of multidimensional characters what was mentioned already in uh, the previous uh, uh, speeches. Uh, in this context, I would like to emphasize the example uh, of good use of legal instruments as uh, dynamic development of offshore wind farms uh, idea in Poland. After entering into force, um, the amendments breaking financial and uh, time term uh, barriers, we have received dozen of uh, br uh, applications for location licenses of wind farms. This is the uh, another uh, problem uh, for the government, uh, how to uh, uh, distribute it uh, and how to recognize who is the uh, uh, very serious uh, investor. But uh, again, uh, the <laughs> this is the best proof that uh, uh, maritime special planning is needed <laughs> for the development of modern economy and uh, expected uh, by investors, local governments and uh, local uh, populations. And uh, my conclusion, I strongly believe that um, with uh, the existing and emerging new exploitation of the uh, seas, where wind farms are just a forerunner proper comprehensive management of uh, sea space has become a must. To achieve this, maritime special plans in all coastal states and mechanism uh, for comprehensive international harmonization, at least within the regional seas, of special solutions are needed. Poland would gladly participate in uh, work to this end. I'm convinced that the conference makes a good possibility to continue good cooperation on the issue 
of the integrated maritime policy, including maritime special planning. I wish all participants fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Bibic Namjotko. I think your points are, are very astute, and I, I, I have seen how important Poland is in the HELCOM nations process. I, I had the honor of, of participating in the Baltic Sea Symposium two summers ago courtesy of uh, my friends at WWF. Uh, Otilia Torreson is here today, and uh, I want to thank them for having invited me. The reason I say this is because when I saw the plans produced looking ahead for the Baltic Sea, I saw wind power everywhere and increasing shipping for tourism and other things everywhere. And it was so clear that these two things, if not planned intelligently and carefully, can lead to great problems. And so I'm thrilled to see such thoughtful consideration of this at the national level in Poland and in Sweden and some other Helcom countries. What I suspect we need, of course, is integration at the larger regional level, and there the EU can play a very important role. And I think our last speaker before our, our press break, uh, Ms. Gessine Meisner, member of European Parliament, uh, can share more insights about how the European Parliament sees the importance of maritime spatial planning to avoid the inevitable collisions, both physical and political, that will happen if we fail to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello everybody. First of all, I of course want to thank uh, our Commissioner Damanaki as well, that she invited me for this conference because I burn for everything that has to do with water. That's some something uh, most people who know me already know, and I think really maritime policy and integrated maritime policy and common approaches are of extreme importance for all of us. And uh, well, whenever I, I talk about integrated maritime policy, first those people who don't know anything about it, they ask me what is this about? And then I uh, try, I explain it as simple as possible. I always say we have only this planet. This planet exists for, it's a blue planet. It, it exists for 70% of water, of ocean, and only 30% is solid ground. And so that sees how important the sustainable, yeah, treat, uh, treating of, of, um, of maritime, of uh, zones, of, of the ocean is for all of us. And uh, Mr. Norris, he said, what is good for the earth is good for people. We could say what is good for the ocean as well, of course, is good for people. I found out that in the European Parliament, many, and not only here, in general, in the member states, many people don't know about the importance for our future of the wet element of the ocean and the seas. And that's why I'm very pleased that so many people are here today. I regret right now already that I can't stay for the whole conference. I would like to do that, but I have several other um, obligations I have to go to. So I think I'm going to ask afterwards what the outcome was of this conference. I see somebody in front I will for sure have contact to, and of course the commissioner as well. Yes, uh, let me first, uh, say something to the other speakers because you all said some things I, I, I believe are absolutely true. First of all, yes, really what is good for the earth is good for people. Economically, if we take care of the biodiversity of the oceans, that's absolutely right. And I think it's a quite good thing that we have a moderator who came from the United States because at first I thought, hey, 
why did he have to do, to, to do such a long journey? But of course, you are very much involved in this issue, and it's important to have an exchange of you with people from other continents as well. For example, when we just had in our European Parliament the um, discussion about the sulfur regulation that has to do with sulfur emissions from ship transport, it is influences, of course, the whole, uh, not the maritime spatial planning, but the whole um, maritime ecosystem. Then somebody from California had been here, a, a lady, and she told us about what they are going to do in, in the United States. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. So she had good solutions. And you mentioned Great Barrier Reef. When I was just finishing my report on integrated maritime policy, somebody, an expert from the Great Barrier Reef, he came towards my office. I felt extremely honored because I thought, wow, Great Barrier Reef is something really of extreme importance of the, for the whole um, world. And everybody wants to go there and he shared his views, his experiences with me uh, from my point of view from European Parliament. Um, our commissioner said that maritime special planning is maybe most important for sustainable exploitation. It's exactly true. If we are not good in the maritime special planning, it won't come uh, out for a good solution. And uh, well, our Polish minister, she mentioned that maritime special planning usually is national competence. That's true, and that's causing some problems sometimes. I can just tell you about an example we have right now uh, with Germany and the Netherlands. Germany and Netherlands are quite good neighbors usually, but right now there is a kind of a struggle uh, with maritime special planning about a special wind park an offshore wind park. They, Germans want to, to build a new offshore wind park and obviously they didn't talk enough with the Netherlands, maybe that's the reason, because now the Netherlands complain and say, I, hey, why you want to build this wind park? It's our area, it's, it's not yours, and so you shouldn't be allowed to do this. Uh, I just make it very brief, this kind of example, but really that shows that maritime special planning, a common maritime special planning, although it's national competence, is extremely important because we all want more wind parks. We want uh, alternative energies, and that's why we shouldn't hinder each other, but work together as much as possible. Yes, um, our Portuguese minister, minister, uh, minister Christa, she mentioned maritime special planning is maybe the most important tool in general for the development of maritime economy, and I think that's ab absolutely true. And, uh, well, now, what do we have to talk about, or what are we talking about? Why is it so important for Europe? Now I come back to Europe. Well, uh, the European GDP, 40% of the European GDP, already comes out of maritime economy, and that shows that's of an economical interest to really uh, take good care of the development, the further development of the sea and of a good maritime special planning. Uh, we are talking about maritime transport. 90% of the worldwide transport is done by vessels, and so there are a lot of vessels uh, on the ocean, and our commissioner already pointed out it's in decreasing transport mode, so it will be still much more in future, and more, of course it will be much more room the vessels need regarding ocean of the sea highways, how we call this, and so on, and that of course could influence all those who plan with offshore wind parks, with fishery, with aquaculture, and so on. We have energy coming out of the sea, and uh, well, of course, energy and aquaculture can be combined, that's what people already found out, and I think it's a good uh, example for a uh, wise mm, maritime special planning. As far as I know, I'm not a specialist on aquaculture, but as far as I know, um, I've heard that offshore wind parks can be combined with aquaculture, and that would mean that in the same spot, both economies could be in a sustainable way combined. And of course, it's a good thing to do. We have the common, the, the traditional fishers who, of course, want to have their room and their outcome as well out of the sea and want to have their spot where they can fish safely without being disturbed by anybody else and without mm, complaining by anybody else. We have the raw material um, issue, it was already mentioned. We have a deep sea ocean mining and uh, seabed mining in general. And, of course, research plays a big role. Research in the 
treasures of the sea will be developed in future in a high um, extent. For example, right now one knows that only 10% of the treasures the ocean can give for people, for human beings, is discovered. And although it's only 10% up to now, they, people already have thousands of products for medicine, for um, cosmetics and whatever. And so I think since uh, the amount of people on Earth will grow rapidly, until 2050 we'll have 9 billion of people on Earth, they want to eat something, they want to have production and they need more and more the sea. That points out again why it's so important to develop the sea in a sustainable way and to have a good maritime special planning. Of course, one thing that wasn't mentioned yet, but it's in our portfolio of our committee, is tourism. Tourism is, not, is of course, not anything that has to do with maritime special planning in a special way, because just like people want to, to go to the sea and to enjoy the sea, but they want to see biodiversity as well, and so that means they are interested in, on the one hand side, having room to enjoy themselves at the beach, but on the other side, to have a sane ocean and to really admire everything that's, that's there regarding biodiversity. So what did we point out in our integrated maritime policy paper regarding maritime special planning? We had several things we asked the Commission and the Member States to do. Some of them are already done because my report was in October 2010 and of course it's now the March of 2012 and something already happened. We asked for a stability, predictability and transparency of management of marine spaces and we said this is a key to securing optimal and sustainable development of economic, for economic activities and new growth and jobs on the sea. And uh, new growth and jobs on the sea, that's something that was already pointed out by our commissioner. She always talks about blue growth and jobs. And I think that's actually what we are facing in future, blue growth and jobs. And of course, we have to take care of this. And while we want to have uh, further development of renewables, such as wind and wave energy, without prejudice to more traditional activities. And uh, we said as a parliament, that the management of intensifying and increasingly competing sea uses on an ecosystem basis requires coordinated, streamlined and cross-border maritime special planning as a neutral tool which has a potential to contribute significantly to the implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and to facilitate the harmonious coexistence of different sea uses. That was our second point, the third point we pointed out, it's that we of course welcome the roadmap on maritime special planning that already exists. This, is, this roadmap based uh, on an eco ecosystem approach and the development of the 10 planning principles and it considers this cross-sectoral policy tool essential for the implementation of IMP, of integrated maritime policy. And we asked the Commission to submit in 2011, so it's already done, a draft on MSP or to propose the type of instrument most su suitable for ensuring coherence between MSP and the other existing initiatives like um, Integrated Coastal Zone Management, Natura 2000 and so on. And uh, besides, we uh, suggested to evaluate opportunities for co-utilization of maritime space by different sectors like shipping and renewable and so on. And we noted that the essential importance of European maritime special planning exists and, it, and the use for coastal regions and the outermost regions in particular. And we pointed out that it's really important to protect the ecologically most sensitive marine biogeographical bio regions while enabling the fishery sectors to exploit resources on a sustainable basis. That was uh, were our points, especially in my report for maritime spatial planning. And uh, just to conclude, I think everybody knows by now, I think you know, you knew, already, you knew already before that maritime spatial planning is of uh, very high importance. And uh, we really are looking forward to a maritime space without barriers. It would be absolutely great to have it, that everybody feels responsible for our maritime space. 
And uh, just at the end, I want to point out that, for example, in Europe, there does already exist a European network maritime of maritime clusters. I met those people, they meet, uh, I think, once or twice a year, and uh, for me it's a very good example that we have in Europe, but not so many people know about it. This includes this uh, European network of maritime clusters, ex excuse, uh, excludes uh, f ship owners and uh, people who run fishery and people who run offshore energy parks and so on, and they all come together, they uh, talk about what they plan in their economy, and they try to share their views and to find good solutions for, as well, maritime special planning. And that's something we really have to have much more often than it exists already now. So thank you very much for your attention.